In 1975, Chicago Public Access Station WTTW decided to develop a television program about the movies. They created the program Opening Soon at a Theater Near You, and hired two local film critics to speak about the latest movies. The critics chosen were Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times and Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. The pairing was unique as the two were not really friendly with each other. They worked for competing newspapers and didn't speak much to each other before and during the show. At the time, they just flat out didn't like each other. Ebert once stated about the program, quote, We didn't see why the other one was quite necessary. We had been linked in a Faustian television format that brought us success at the price of autonomy. No sooner had I expressed a verdict on a movie, my verdict, than here came Siskel with the arrogance to say I was wrong, or for that matter, the condescension to agree with me. It really felt like that. It was not an act. When we disagreed, there was incredulity. When we agreed, there was a kind of relief. Taping of these early episodes proved to be a massive challenge, as the production of one half-hour episode would take as long as eight hours to film. While the production eventually loosened so that filming went progressively faster, the two still fought constantly. There were arguments about who should come first in the title of the program, which films would be discussed that week, and even where they were going to eat lunch. They did decide on their reviewing format of thumbs up for a recommendation or thumbs down for the opposite. Opening soon at a theater near you soon became sneak previews. Later in the 1980s, the duo left that show to host Siskel and Ebert at the movies, under Buena Vista in wider syndication. And although their weekly show discussed more than just what films you should see at the theater that weekend, as with their specials on black and white films and the importance of letterboxing, the great appeal of the program was the rivalry on the latest movies. It became a major selling point of the show. When the program became Siskel and Ebert, their new intro featured the pair arguing about each other's reviews before cutting into the program. Feuds make for great theater, and the conflicting views of film were enough to keep Siskel and Ebert a constant source of televised film criticism by being as entertaining as it was informative. But this act of theater has become muddied over the years due to a number of factors. So, what led to this point in film discourse? Our next film is Lost in Space. This big budget version of the 1960s camp classic is Leonardo, Di off. Leonardo DiCaprio is hunky. Leonardo DiCaprio is not what we're talking about right now. We're talking it, about Lost in it's Space. It's what I'm talking about, big boy. He's hunky. Damn it, Gene! Siskel and Ebert clashed on a number of films, and it mostly had to do with how they approached the process. Gene Siskel frequently referred to his review style as that of a beat reporter. He treated every film as though it were breaking news in the community, reporting in a rushed newsroom style to get the reader or viewer interested and give them the information quickly. This usually made him the critic who gave the fast response, although Ebert has stated that Siskel would often miss many deadlines. Roger Ebert took a bit of a more thoughtful approach. Oftentimes, Ebert tries to look at film from what it made him feel and how other audiences might feel about it. One aspect where Ebert was quite understanding was in the realm of children's entertainment. He'd often try to cite his own experiences from childhood to better relate to pictures not aimed at his own demographic. It's from this angle where we can see how they clash so easily. Perhaps their most two famous bouts were between the films Cop and a Half and Carnosaur. For the film Cop and a Half, Ebert found the film particularly cute and appreciated the young child actor for the role, while Siskel was not as won over by the childlike atmosphere of a kid and a cop. For Carnosaur, Siskel was pleased by the campy B-movie craziness of the picture, while Ebert was less impressed with low-budget special effects. This feud between the two has often led to them citing defensive stances as evidence that they are lacking as critics. Oh, come on, Gene. That was just another pointless sequel that didn't have to be made. This? From the man who liked Benji the Hunted? Hey, you like Carnosaur. Well, I'll bet you'll like this. Sometimes Siskel and Ebert came together, though. In one of their most legendary of televised debates, they both argued against the critic who called Return of the Jedi a bad film that was, quote, making children dumber. Um, they are for children, and they're brutalizing children, they're stultifying children, they're making children uh, dumber than they need to be. I totally disagree with Mr. Simon. I don't know uh, what he did as a child, but I spent a lot of my Saturday matinees watching science fiction movies and serials and having a great time of being stimulated and having my imagination stimulated and having 
uh, all sorts of visions take place in my mind that help me to become an adult and to still say young at heart. And I would say not that I'm childlike, but that he is old at heart. Yeah, when I, uh, I think that Mr. Simon ought to do what I did over the weekend. I went to a regular movie theater in a shopping center in Michigan City, Indiana, and I sat amid all the kids. You, there was one tall head and a lot of small heads. Were they dumber than they needed to be? No, they weren't dumber, to quote that in interesting phrase. <laughs> uh, they uh, were ecstatic. They were enjoying it, and they were rooting. They were asking each other who's who. They were getting all involved. They were rooting for the right guys and booing the bad guys. I thought it was a lot of fun. Uh, I, I feel badly, honestly, I feel badly that this uh, other critic, John Simon, didn't have a good time at these pictures. That's too bad for him. At a press luncheon, they addressed Senator Bob Dole's controversial statements on movie violence and rap music, while discussing their own issues on the movie industry and how movies are reported on. Today, Mike Flannery, who works for WBBM-TV in Chicago and used to work for the Sun-Times in Chicago, uh, cornered uh, uh, Senator Dole and asked himself stuff. He said, I don't have a legislative agenda. I never said I was a film critic. Now, how can you say that? Of course he was trying to be a film critic. I mean, he says his nine-year-old son agrees with him. What, mm -hmm. on Pulp Fiction? I mean, excuse me, on Natural Born Killers? Did his, I mean, those kind of flip remarks don't add anything. This is one of my favorite Siskel and Ebert videos because it really gets to the heart of what I really dig about these guys. They speak at length about how powerful such films as Pulp Fiction and Hoop Dreams are to cinema, and are so dismayed by the schlock of stuff like the Flintstones that they decided not to show the clip they were going to set up. Though Siskel and Ebert continued to bicker, their numerous interviews throughout the 1990s suggested that they started to have more of an affection for one another. They spoke about how they used to be so distant in their early days, but seemed to relent over time that they cared for each other more as co-workers than journalism rivals. One of the things I admired most about Cecil and Ebert was not just their camaraderie and clashing, but how they seemed to come together when it came to the defense of film and film criticism. Whenever they went on a talk show, they were both collected enough to properly explain aspects of media critique that may seem foreign or not as widely understood by most audiences. When they went on Johnny Carson, the host remarked how reading different critics could be frustrating if they offered opposing views, as though critics somehow collectively decided whether or not a film is good or bad. Ebert corrected him that reviews offer varying perspectives. When they went on David Brenner, the host remarked that he didn't understand reviews when a critic hated a film, but he liked it. Siskel politely explained how Brenner's opinion wasn't wrong, but neither was the opinion of the critic likening their status to that of an art gallery tour guide, being knowledgeable enough in the medium but not a firm stance on public perception or appreciation of art. And then, tragedy struck. In 1998, Gene Siskel was diagnosed with a cancerous brain tumor, and in early 1999, died due to complications during surgery. Ebert was absolutely crestfallen and deeply mourned the loss of his co-critic. Though he continued on for a few episodes on his own within the balcony set, he quickly realized this was not a job that he could do alone. He needed another critic to spar with. Between 1999 and 2000, Ebert had a number of guest critics on the program to find out which one would be the best fit to carry on the two-person format. He ultimately decided on critic Richard Roper. Roger was initially reluctant to choose Roper since he also wrote at the Chicago Sun-Times, but Roger's wife Chaz eventually convinced him to go ahead with Roper. In terms of being someone to spar with, Roper was an ample choice. He often took a firmly cynical perspective to certain films that Roger often tried to counter. Most of this was with kids entertainment when Roger went to bat for the Spongebob movie while Roper declared its adult crowd to be... on drugs. One of their best exchanges was on Steven Spielberg's War of the Worlds. While Roper gave a mild recommendation, Ebert could not bring himself to raise his thumb. Roper then questioned why Roger would not recommend War of the Worlds, but would recommend recent remakes of The Honeymooners and The Longest Yard. Ebert rejected the notion of comparing the likes of Steven Spielberg's blockbuster to much cheaper and lesser ambitious comedies. He argued that his ratings are both relative and arbitrary. They are relative in that he compares Spielberg's films not to the current crop of movies, but of Spielberg's previous entries in science fiction. The ratings are arbitrary in that there is no firm science behind a star or thumb rating, merely acting as shorthand at their best and pointless marketing at their worst. 
Ebert fervently argued that reviews have contexts and gradations which should be given more notice than the dumb thumbs or the dumb stars. Though Ebert would depart the show after a surgery left him without a voice or a jaw, the show continued on in various forms. Roper continued hosting the show, retitled At the Movies with Ebert and Roper, with various critics filling in for Roger before settling on Michael Phillips. That show went off the air in 2008. A new version of At the Movies would replace it in a similar format, with critics Ben Lyons and Ben Mankiewicz, later replaced with A.O. Scott and Michael Phillips. And when the show was cancelled in 2010, At the Movies would take its final form with Ebert Presents At the Movies. Now despite that title, Ebert would only appear in tail end segments to give one review of the week, via a narration by Bill Curtis with accompanying footage of Ebert typing up his reviews. The competing review format of the show was filled by critics Christy Lemire and Ignaty Vishnetsky. The show was eventually cancelled after only a few episodes and about three years before Ebert's death. And with that cancellation, the format of film discussion evaporated from the airwaves. There would be no replacement program for At The Movies, making it clear that one of the biggest proponents of this kind of televised discussion of film was a product entirely of Siskel and Ebert's doing. When they died, so did their television format. Now of course the discussion has shifted to the more open fields of online podcasts and videos. And while the discourse thrives more in an environment that requires less overhead for bandwidth and spread, there was a certain bond and influence that Siskel, Ebert, and even Roper wield in their chemistry that has been unmatched in the age of online criticism. The type of film discourse that followed online was more… different. And it started bubbling quite early as the age of online journalism took flight. I finally got on the internet. And I, it seemed to me from what I'd heard that the internet was going to be millions of people all over the world engaged in this uplifting discourse. And as nearly as I could tell in some of the used groups that I went to, it basically consisted of hundreds and hundreds of undergraduates telling each other that they sucked. <laughs> uh, The website Rotten Tomatoes was developed in 1998 by Sen Duong as a project he cobbled together in his spare time. Duong's idea was to collect links of numerous movie reviews online and have them all available to search by title. Being a fan of Jackie Chan, Duong initially coded the site to cover Chan's films that were coming to or being developed in the United States. The film Rush Hour was coming out at the time, and he wanted to have the site ready to cover it. Within its first week of launching, Rotten Tomatoes was already a success, having a high level of visitors and being spoken of highly by news outlets. In 2000, Duong turned the site into a full-time gig with his web design partners of Patrick Y. Lee and Stephen Wang. From there, the website has been under many owners. IGN bought it in 2004, right before IGN was bought by News Corp in 2005. IGN then sold Rotten Tomatoes to Flickster in 2010, and then Warner Brothers bought Rotten Tomatoes in 2011. In 2016, Comcast Fandango Ticket Service took ownership, but with Warner Brothers still holding a stake in the company. The site's function now is to collect reviews and sort them into positive ratings, which are fresh, and negative ratings, which were rotten. Those reviews are then tallied up to give a percentage of how many of those reviews were fresh. The grade school metric applies of below 60% being rotten and above 60% being fresh. Films that rank above 75% with a minimum of 5 of those positive scores being from top critics are generally considered certified fresh, which basically means there's a fancy sticker to place on the marketing posters and commercials. How Rotten Tomatoes selects and aggregates reviews has changed over the years. Typically, they would recognize members of major news publications and writing guilds. The bigger publications would receive top billing as top critics. Over the years, with the changing nature of online journalism, their requirements have been altered to cater to more online voices and even video reviewers as well. Their reviews are picked up by the website, displayed as either fresh or rotten, and with a blurb from their review posted with a link to the full review. The percentages, however, are the major draw of the site. If you go to Rotten Tomatoes right now, you'll notice the one thing that grabs you immediately are the percentage scores, even though it's only in a sidebar. Even outside of Rotten Tomatoes, the website is referenced in percentages only. Search a movie on Google and the numbers will pop up at the top of the sidebar. Search a movie on Fandango when getting tickets and you'll see the tomato meter. 
Search a movie on Vudu and you'll see the percentage alongside a red tomato or green splat. Now at least on Vudu, when you click on the movie, you will get a few excerpts of the reviews, but there's no links to the full review. The prevailing nature of the mostly cited percentage score often leads to misconceptions about what this number means. Many misinterpret the percentage as an average score, as though the percentage is what the majority of critics agreed upon. But given how little other information from Rotten Tomatoes instantly attracts the eyeballs, it can sometimes be an easy mistake. So let's clear this up. When you click on a film on Rotten Tomatoes, you'll be presented with the tomato meter. Click on See Score Details, and you'll see average ratings from critics. You didn't need to click on these details to see this information before, it was just right on the movie's page when you got there, but the interface has changed for what I can only assume was reasoned as a cleaner design. But whatever the reasoning, if you want to complain about the average critic ratings, that information is here, not here. You'll notice the audience score gives the same details on average ratings, and the audience score has been a whole other beast. In the site's earlier days, Rotten Tomatoes additionally functioned as a blogging platform. Users could not only give their Rotten Tomatoes score on a range of 1 to 10, but could write their own lengthy reviews in a profile resembling a bit of a blogspot layout. That blog format was soon transitioned out for a format previously adopted by Flickster. Rather than rating films on the 1 to 10 tomato meter score, users could only select a rating of 1 to 5 stars, with half stars included. If the user hadn't seen the film yet, but wanted to, they could select Want to See. If they had no intention of seeing the film, they could select Not Interested. This audience rating system was integrated with Rotten Tomatoes, and the blog format essentially left, replaced with an interface more akin to Google user reviews. The reviews are aggregated in the same way as the tomato meter, except instead of fresh and rotten, the icons are a tub of popcorn or a spilt tub of popcorn. Previously, users could just flat out give star ratings before a film had even debuted, making the site relatively easy to review bomb before a premiere without having seen the film. Rotten Tomatoes most recently corrected this by restricting the audience score to being entered and aggregated on release day. Reactionaries love to point out the discrepancies between critics and audience scores, as though they are in constant battle with one another, even though it is really just a collective of critics from competing publications amassed for a percentage, posed against an unscientific sample size of the audience. They point out how critics and audiences can never agree. They cite films such as Sonic the Hedgehog having 64% on the tomato meter versus the 93% audience score. Yet that theory could be disproven by a film that was released that same month, Birds of Prey, where the critics and audience score were literally the same number. Because at the end of the day, they're just numbers, and you can spin any wild narrative you want from them if you simply refuse to read the reviews and merely concoct your conspiracy from a glance. From this perspective, agitators take strange routes of opposing the tomato meter. When the Rotten Tomato score for Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice was revealed, it was a dismal 27%. Director Zack Snyder joked about it, and Ben Affleck got really sad when he heard the news in an interview. This made the fans of the film mad, but what could they do? Well, they could voice their opinion on the site to make their arguments why they love the film and the audience score. But for many, that was not enough. A collective of the fans banded together for a petition to shut Rotten Tomatoes down for, quote, biased critics. The original posting of the petition was to defend Batman v Superman and Suicide Squad, mashed in spelling and grammar errors that were most likely pounded out on a keyboard in haste. To this day, the petition remains, but with a reworded declaration, reading, quote, There's a disconnect between critics and audiences. You may enjoy a movie regardless what the critics say about it. We just get the people to know that the criticism, not the measure of the quality of movie. It's just the opinions of the critics. And it's like, they almost get it. They almost come to the epiphany that critics are merely stating their opinion, and that their opinion could run counter to your own, and then somehow come to the conclusion that it means Rotten Tomatoes must fall. Now look, this is not to say that Rotten Tomatoes doesn't have any problems. There have been issues with the tomato meter, sometimes being unsure how to interpret the ambiguous 2.5 star rating. 
But perhaps one of the most unorthodox situations in the use of the tomato meter was with 2017's Justice League. See, Rotten Tomatoes was trying to promote a new talk show they had on discussing the movies and their ratings. But since it looked about as blandly overproduced as any other show about movies online, the show needed a hook, and Rotten Tomatoes had the perfect way to get people to pay attention to them. With Justice League being the newest film on the horizon, Rotten Tomatoes decided to postpone the percentage of the tomato meter until November 16th. Though the film was being released on November 17th, the press embargo when reviews could be posted was November 15th. What this meant was that reviews would be posted online for the film a full day before they would be counted appropriately on Rotten Tomatoes. If one were to be as fervently consuming of conspiracies, one might make the remark that this was a power play by Warner Brothers to increase ticket sales. After all, Warner Brothers owned a chunk of Rotten Tomatoes, and if the reviews were held off until the day before the movie came out, pre-sale tickets would increase before Rotten scores would come in. The conspiracy was false, however, and was really just a move by Rotten Tomatoes to promote their struggling talk show. But even if there were more validity to it, the same conspiracy who thought DC dunkers were bribed by Marvel wouldn't favor such a theory because it runs counter to their narrative of paid-off critics. I mean, like, maybe the critics just liked or disliked a film genuinely? One might favor this take when reading more into the reviews, but such a take doesn't garner hate clicks and conspiracy clicks. Many just love to look at the percentage score and form whatever wild story they can dream up. Some of these stories are fairly predictable. Theories about critics being bribed or that they collectively decided on the score secretly like a hive mind. There's also the very rickety argument of reviews not being valid because they're not objective enough. It's just a bad argument filled with fallacies that'll make your brain melt, so it's best not to think about it. Actually, you know what? That's a bit of a cop-out. Let's discuss that anyway. And if the movie, if you come out of the movie and there's nothing to say, and the movie was complete, then to my mind it wasn't an interesting film because it has to leave you with something that you have to make up your own mind about. Some movie reviewers, mostly the ones on YouTube though, like to hold the belief that their reviews are unbiased and objective, as opposed to other critics which showcases just how little they understand on the nature of art critique. Such a notion of remaining on this fictitious plane when it comes to art review is an impossible and foolish endeavor to strive towards. So let's dig into the basics. Every movie review contains a bias. Some more pronounced than others depending on the particular perspective in the review, but bias is always present in some form. We all have it, and we're all guilty of it. But bias is not a weakness, far from it. Bias often gives a reviewer a personal edge in their reviews to make them distinct. But more importantly, it gives off honesty. Now how one constructs a review is debatable, but most critics would agree a foundation of a great review is making it personal. Because it's you explaining why you like or dislike a film. As for objectivity, this is merely a component of review and not a basis or selling point for a review to be based upon. Example, in Avengers Endgame, the Avengers fight Thanos. This is objective, as it is a factual and provable event that happened in the film. Nobody can dispute that the Avengers and Thanos do battle in this movie. Now, whether that fight was exciting or not is subjective. Some may enjoy the fight, and others may find it tedious. There is no collective universal agreement on the entertainment of this film's special effects heavy climax. Now, we can use objectivity to argue our opinion. We may say that the abundance of special effects, which is objective, made the fight too hard to follow, which is subjective. Objectivity is a tool when it comes to explaining what happens in a film, but when it comes to breaking down why that film was good or bad, that is where the reviewer must resort to subjectivity, because it is an unavoidable route in review. No review is objective, because reviews of art are themselves subjective by their very nature. Consequently, no film is objectively good or bad. Citizen Kane is not an objectively good film in the same way that The Room is not an objectively bad film. You may feel that they are good or bad films, but your opinion on a film is just that. It's an opinion, not an objective fact. 
This is very basic information, but you would be surprised how many people can't grasp this concept of objectivity versus subjectivity. Now, sure, if you really want to get into the weeds of philosophical and psychoanalytical ideas, one could possibly make the argument that our opinions are a product of our own superego based on our objective societal influences. If we entertain that idea, however, we'd also have to enter into a bit of a paradox where all subjectivity is equally as objective, for serving under the same basis. Now, whether that objectivity is true makes for a debatable discussion of just how cognizant we are of our own subconsciousness and free will as well as the influences that shape our worldview and perceptions when it comes to how we watch movies. But, you know, somehow I think that's a debate too dense for people who just want to tell you a movie really, really sucked. So then, why do some movie reviewers retreat to this fool's errand of striving for objectivity in their review? Well, part of it is defensiveness for their opinion being most right. If they spin the lie that their reviews are objective as opposed to subjective, they proclaim their reviews as inarguable facts devoid of feeling, and anyone saying anything different will be targeted as being against facts, as though they were promoting heresy on the science of movies being good or bad. Also, I don't know about you, but reviewing movies without personal feelings just seems really boring. Usually reviewers who like to pretend they're being objective are doing so in response towards other critics, by labeling opposing reviews as wrong. Now let's be clear, retorting to a review being wrong is fine in terms of an opinion piece, but when that retort comes branded as some objective truth, it loses that power of opinion and enters into a weird void of argument paradox. If a review can be objective, then it would have to be factual enough to be agreed upon. Which is absolutely not the case with reviews, because if it were, the only percentage ratings on Rotten Tomatoes would be 100% or 0%. Subjectivity is especially true if a so-called objective review is in response to another review, because it is challenging subjectivity with subjectivity, pretending to be objectivity. With this in mind, the reviewer must either acknowledge that all views are subjective, including their own, or engage in some wild egotism that only they know the truth about movies and everyone else who writes reviews have just been doing it wrong with their objectively wrong opinions. These objective reviewers amass an audience, and it's easy enough to see why. If their reviews are viewed as objective, then they are factual. If they are factual, then they cannot be argued against. If they cannot be argued against, then we don't have to look at film in any other way than the rigid view of what has been proclaimed as objectivity. This lazy acceptance is very appealing to our instant everything society where nobody has time for anything more than headlines or cliff notes. This is a very shallow way of looking at movies and does a great disservice to the discourse. But if a review is objective, well then hey, why should we have to listen to anyone else on the topic? Why should we care what a black person thinks of Black Panther or a gay person thinks of Rocket Man? The objective reviewer's audience need not concern themselves with other perspectives, or even view the film differently for themselves, because they already have their objective analysis, as if that is a real thing when it comes to a movie being good or bad. Now, to counter this idiocy of favoring objectivism when getting steamed if a review subjectively runs counter to your own opinion, a quick solution I've often heard is that audiences should gravitate towards a critic whose views align more with their own. Now, while such favor Favoritism does better suit the immediate answer that if a film is worthy of your money that weekend, it also closes one off from a broader discussion of film. I would actually argue the opposite. You should listen to and read from critics you disagree with, not because you should agree with them, but because they give you a grander perspective on how a film is perceived. In doing so, you not only hear more diverse opinions on the topic, but can also better understand why someone might like a film that you disliked, or vice versa, rather than just forming weird conspiracies in your head that only one reviewer is right and that the rest of the world is somehow doing it wrong. Or, you know, whatever, you can just live in your little bubble pretending you're the only sane one in a world gone mad. Like your Neo in The Matrix, or Johnny and Johnny Mnemonic, you know, whichever Keanu Reeves film you favor. 
The whole favoring of objectivism just seems weird and full of holes that are plugged up with clumpy globs of cynicism. Now what exactly formed this tabula rasa of an objective critic I can't say with absolute certainty, but there's perhaps a bit of inspiration that most likely came from a more successful channel, one that talks about film in a manner lacking critical theory yet seeming just and lucrative in its assertions. Now there's a lot of examples on YouTube to choose from, but Ah, uh, hell, let's just go with the big one everyone's thinking of. Roger, I have one question. Okay. Did either Johnny Carson or Ed McMahon give you a million dollars on TV recently? Yeah, and I also got a house and a boat and three weeks in Tahiti. How'd you do? CinemaSins is the very antithesis of film critique. Now upon making that statement, one might argue that they don't do film critique because they label their videos as satire, a mocking play on being overly nitpicky about films. Their Everything Wrong With series does this with every film, pointing out flaws in every movie they dub as sins. These videos are supposedly framed as being jokes, but the problem is they are treated as film criticism and in some cases, as noted in parallels with CinemaSins more genuine reviews, actual criticism. Their jokes, often based on being bereft of knowledge both external and internal to the films they mock, are treated as insight and given the same credence as review. Of the very comments I scrolled through in their videos, a number of them treated these sins as an advisement not to see a movie they may have intended to watch. For such atrocious autopsies of art, CinemaSins many, well, sins have not gone unnoticed. Correcting and mocking cinema sins has turned into a pastime all its own by YouTubers who actually give a shit about film, and when it's misinterpreted and slathered in surface level scathings. CinemaSins has been directly criticized by filmmakers, as with Jordan Voigt Roberts going on the offensive, stating, quote, These guys are just trolling the art form we love and profiting from it while dumbing down the conversation. Now that's bad enough that they're lowering the bar for movie discourse, and hang on to that thought, we'll come back to it. But what's most troubling about CinemaSins is their ultimate intent in the assembly of their videos. Their creators are established SEO experts that have established their channel to specifically tailor to the likes of the algorithm, to be as viewable and profitable as possible. Now, everybody needs to eat, but when gaining a paycheck essentially means churning out an endless slew of videos that are often riddled with inconsistencies and glaring errors in observation, the content becomes secondary in terms of its intent. If CinemaSins is committed to changing anything, it's for the benefit of the algorithm, not their content or the discussion of film. Their content gets clicks and that's all they care about. They're about as insightful to film as late stage G4 was to video games, more concerned with staying afloat than committed to some mission statement of devotion to the arts. Sadly, this motive has spilled into other YouTube channels as well, those that have resorted to clickbait for bucks rather than critical thinking. Around the time that Captain Marvel was coming out, the fervor that actor Brie Larson stirred up for talking about diversity in film criticism not only inspired heated YouTubers to make anti-Captain Marvel videos daily, but even flat out admit they were only making so many of these videos for the clicks and cash. They argued that these videos gave them more attention and more ad revenue than anything else they had produced. And that was apparently justification for being obnoxiously obsessed with decrying one movie nearly every day for an entire month. Or longer. Many of these videos were also exceptionally ignorant in their research, not unlike CinemaSins and their scattershot and mistake-making ways of producing too much content too quickly. One of the collective topics was how Disney was forcing Fandango to only allow you to pre-order Captain Marvel tickets and nothing else. All these YouTubers would have to do is peer one week further to notice that pre-order tickets are only available for new movies when they're so far out from release date. And yet none of them made this discovery, going on for 12 minute videos about how this was some sort of Disney conspiracy that could easily be disproven in 12 seconds. But that's the thing about these videos. It doesn't matter if they're incoherent in their research, bereft of honesty, reaching for content, or even if they're debunked. Because the deed is done. They got their clicks and ad revenue and that's all that matters in the end. Which is specifically why I'm choosing not to reference any of their videos here. It is in this shifting of content creation that the grounds of criticizing film, and more importantly the debate of film, becomes troublingly muddied. 
Conspiracies and cynicism are just more fun to spin daily, even if they are lies based on little to no information. We see it all the time in trashy tabloids, scripted reality television, and daytime talk shows. And now it unfortunately occupies a part of film discourse. You want to play some two-on-two? -two? You and me sure, against Siskel and Eber? Why not? Right. Great. <laughs> Take it back, Rod. There you go. Yes. Roger Ebert once gave an extra negative review of Vincent Gallo's film The Brown Bunny, calling it the worst film at the Cannes Film Festival. In response, Gallo publicly wished that Ebert would get colon cancer. Later on, Ebert was diagnosed with cancer of the thyroid. Surprised by this development, Ebert merely joked back at Gallo that his aim was off. Filmmakers generally have a love-hate relationship with critics. They love them when they praise their work as it means more exposure, and absolutely despise them when they give a negative review and trash their work. Some are more understanding than others, and it varies based on the reviews. Some filmmakers find means through their art of firing back. 1990's Gremlins 2 featured critic Leonard Maltin getting mauled by the monsters. 1994's The Ref named one of the villains Siskel. 1998's Godzilla posed the New York mayor and his advisor as obvious parodies of Siskel and Ebert and so on. Sometime filmmakers become oddly angry at their critics. When director Uwe Boll heard negative reviews of his movies House of the Dead and Alone in the Dark, he decided to challenge his critics to a boxing match. In 2006, he staged Raging Bull, an event where Bull would box his critics in a 10-round match for each critic. He challenged Richard Kayanka of SomethingAwful.com, Chris Alexander of Rue Morgue Magazine, Jeff Snyder of Ain't It Cool News, and freelance critic Chance Minter. Uwe won against all critics, which isn't surprising considering he has had training, whereas the critics have little to no experience in the sport, some of them even relying on Bull for a few tips while boxing. Now, critics went along with Boxing Bull because, let's face it, that's just good PR. It's not every critic who gets to claim they boxed a filmmaker whose movie they tore to shreds. Bull did it for PR as well, but also as a means of blowing off steam. In some ways, it seemed to mend a certain connection between filmmakers and critics. They came together to do something outside of their clashing craft and engaged in the sport. Not all defensive filmmakers are so physically brash, however, when it comes to responding to their critics and journalists. <laughs> of the channel has made a name for herself as a provocateur, often slinging celebrity gossip and flat-out lies for clicks. One of her more recent bouts on Twitter was with Birds of Prey director Kathy Yan. When Yan gave sympathy to David Ayer for his film Suicide Squad being retooled, took this as confirmation that Birds of Prey had reshoots for a cut subplot about dick pics. Noticing this rumor, Jan shot it down by responding with, quote, Excuse me, you have no idea what you're talking about. It's fascinating you would deem to try when you weren't part of the process whatsoever. <laughs> gave the defense more akin to a tabloid journalist by stating, quote, No reporter is ever part of the process. They're different jobs. Everything I reported is common knowledge with many insiders. I brought it to the public. I gave your film a good review, and I said here you have a strong fan base. So logically, there should be no problem here. Though Jan was thankful for the review, she once more stated this level of gossip was not journalism. <laughs> once more retreated to her sources, stating she read a few reports, though those reports were not cited in her tweets, with the exception of others just tweeting back at her with the dick pics rumors. Now, sometimes when directors still have films floating in theaters or on video on demand, they'll often remain tight-lipped on their film's problems to keep their jobs and continue to direct another day. They may speak differently after some time when the statute of limitations lifts on their film. But when it comes to a scoop on a film, I'm more inclined to favor the side of the filmmaker with direct insight on the production, rather than relying on so-called journalists who heard some rumors and read some sketchy articles, especially since one of the more incendiary articles accused Birds of Prey of pedophilia, reported as a rumor from half a year before the film debuted. So this is just a rumor-slinging movie dirt hound. Her reporting no different from the trashy gossip rags in the supermarket checkout. This wasn't an isolated incident either, it's like her regular thing. She has continued to make ridiculously unbased movie news remarks and has continuously been called out by filmmakers for getting things wrong. She thrives on this sloppy sensationalism for clicks, which is why 
why, as you may have noticed, her name has been redacted from this video. Filmmakers are justified in calling out such trashy reporting, critic or otherwise. But sometimes, filmmakers can fly off the handle on critics in much more vitriolic ways, as with the troubling case of Jason Leigh Howden. So there was this movie that came out in February 2020 called Guns Akimbo. It starred Daniel Radcliffe as this guy with guns attached to his hands. It looked like a fun bit of gritty and goofy violence, and paired well with the month that had seen such neon and ultra-violent action films as Birds of Prey, Come to Daddy, and VFW. But several critics refused to review the film for a very troubling controversy. The movie review site Much Ado About Cinema was where this all started. Direct messages surfaced of the site's editor, Delara Elber, using the N-word. As Elber quickly apologized, many of the staff decided to leave the website in droves. When this issue surfaced on Twitter, Elber received a number of hostile tweets and attempted to commit suicide for fearing that her life was over because of this screw-up. This is a very serious issue when suicide enters the equation. And one would think when things get this bad that everyone would settle down. Maybe we could all just lay down our negativity and recognize what Elber did was wrong, but that she shouldn't be bullied into suicide because nobody should really. And that's exactly what many of the writers who left did, checking in to see if she was okay. But that's not what Guns Akimbo director Jason Leigh Howden had in mind. No, when he heard that Elber had almost killed herself, he went on the offensive in the worst way possible. Howden was mad and wanted someone to blame, and since he didn't know who was specifically sending her all these cyberbullying tweets, he decided to attack the writers who left the website, accusing them of nearly driving their editor to the brink of death. He tagged all the writers who left, calling them woke cyberbullies and trolls with added hypocrisy. He also threatened a boycott of whichever website that would hire them, trying to blackball them from the industry. Of course, these writers have stated they weren't behind the attacks on Elber and did not endorse them. Many of them even displayed their letters of resignation, which were very formal and not aggressive. They were even deeply concerned about Elber after her suicide attempt, and soon learned from mutual friends that she was recovering after such an incident. Yet, Howden continued to post about these writers, and even put up their profile pictures in a tweet to point out who he deemed as cyberbullies, even though they were not the cyberbullies in question. Howden continued to go on a Twitter tirade against anyone who spoke against his actions being hypocritical, of inciting cyberbullying to combat cyberbullying. He not only continued calling these writers trolls and guilty of nearly driving a woman to suicide, but also did so from his movie's promotional Twitter account. Seriously, how much of a dickhole do you have to be to use your own film's Twitter account, which is normally used for bland promotional activities, as a means of harassing people? Since Howden's reasoning for the people he called out as being abusive towards Elber was based on a false accusation, we can shift to his other rush to the defense of Elber. He asserted that she did nothing wrong to begin with, and spoke of her use of the n-word as being ironic, and that she shouldn't have been abandoned by her writers who, as he describes, were woke trolls. So his case for being hostile at this point was essentially the old and controversial cry of, I wanna say the n-word. So, yeah, not good. Also, telling the black writers of the site that they shouldn't be offended when their boss uses the n-word is not a good take. After Howden posted pictures of two black critics who left the site and labeled them as disgusting film writers, several critics refused to review Guns Akimbo, and the few that had already seen the film requested that their reviews be removed from poll quotes. So if you're a filmmaker, maybe don't use your film's Twitter account to cyberbully critics who did nothing wrong, especially when your own film was apparently about cyberbullying. It's just not a good look. I got a call uh, from our producer who uh, I was in, um, I was out of state. And so Marlene, his wife, tried to reach me, couldn't reach me, and called the producer who was able to find me. And then I talked to her immediately. And um, how are they holding up, the, the, the kids and the wife? It's really tough. It's really tough. What will we say about each other when we grow older? When we pass? How will we address those we spoke together with on film? Will we look back lovingly on the debates we had, appreciating our vigor and appeal for the art? I often think about this as I grow older, questioning what I want out of film and film criticism when time passes further. 
When I ask myself what is the most important aspect of film that makes me love it so much, the answer has been clear for the longest time. Empathy. Film lets us step out of our own shoes and into someone else's, allowing us to see things in a different perspective, whether it's in another neighborhood, another part of the globe, or a fantastically fictional part of the galaxy. Rich or poor, black or white, man or woman, gay or straight. I believe film criticism can have empathy as well, letting us see film from different views. I like reading and hearing about film in various reviews and books and video essays from those who bring something insightful to the table. I enjoy critique to such a degree that when I disagree with someone else's opinions, I don't jump to a grudge. Because film is just film. It's storytelling burned into reels and encoded into digital data. There's a lot of films I love, but I don't attach myself to my favorites to define my friendship or establish a vendetta. Someone who doesn't like Parasite is not my enemy, nor is someone who likes Joker. I appreciate different points of view, and as long as those views are coming from some place personal and honest, and not just being a clickbaity or bad faith act, I value that perspective. Gene Siskel continued reviewing films right up to his unexpected death in 1999. When he died, Ebert spoke highly of him. Later on, Ebert, even without voice or his show, continued writing about movies right up to his death in 2013. When he passed, there were many kind things to say from his colleagues and debaters. Will we be the same? Will we speak of each other as those who had a passion and love for films? Rewatching old episodes of Siskel and Ebert, realizing that these two critics are no longer with us, gives off a strangely nostalgic sensation of what I always wanted film criticism to be. There was rivalry, but there was passion. There was debate, but there was decorum. There was joking, but there was intelligence. Personally, I consider film criticism paramount and a necessity of the medium. I can only hope that those of us who have chosen to pursue this profession are doing it because we appreciate the art. Because I dig this medium too much to let it go down in a pile of flaming cynicism. I write and speak about film because I love it. And I hope you do too. Whether our tastes align or not. When one of the TV news magazines profiled you, it made point that you really don't like each other. True or false? Both. <laughs> Neither. <laughs>